Hey, how's it going, everybody? We're back for episode 152 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. And today we have our second and final part of our very short series. I guess you can call it just a two part series Women in Martial Arts. Last week's episode, part one, um, blew the doors off. It might be no surprise that the Thursday episodes, while we put a lot of work into them, they're not quite as popular as the Monday episodes, the interviews that we do. However, Last Thursday's episode, part one, not only had a record debut for a Thursday show, but it was probably one of the top 10 debuts we've had for any episode. So that makes me feel great because we'd kind of wondered, is this something that we should jump into for two parts? Is it something we should really jump into at all? I mean, we got a lot of feedback from people wanting this, but you never know. Sometimes the people that want something are the ones that are the loudest and they're the only ones that want it. But clearly that was not the case. You all enjoyed that episode. We had some great feedback. So here we are for part two. And really, it's a whole separate episode, different questions, a little bit of overlap, but with three different returning guests. And if you want to check out the show notes or the other episodes, if you want to link to part one, if you want to hear the individual episodes for today's guests, you can do all that at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. There's links to everything that we do. I really appreciate everyone's support as we move forward, as we try new things, as I challenge myself, as I challenge you all as listeners to become better martial artists and help us grow this show, this community. Without further ado, here we go. Sensei Jordan, Mrs. Pettengill, and Ms. Henderson, welcome back to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thank you for having us back. Hello. Yes, thank you. I appreciate it. Hey, I'm looking forward to this. Now, I'll, I'll give a little bit of an intro because I don't know what I'm going to do with the intros and the outros on these episodes. And I don't even know if this is going to be the first one or the one that I recorded last night is going to be the first one. And anybody out there listening is probably wondering, what the heck is Jeremy talking about? We're having a couple of these sort of roundtables to discuss um, some topics that have come up within episodes and, and kind of side conversation around episodes around women in martial arts. And so what we did is we went back and we got a few of the, the women that were kind enough to be guests on the show and said, hey, you want to come back? And most of them said yes. Actually, everybody said yes. And so we've got the three of you here and we're going to have a chat. In fact, more so you three are going to have a chat. I'm going to chime in from time to time and we're just going to kind of see how this goes. Our Sounds first... good to me. All right. Yeah, that's great. Now, the questions that we're going to ask came out of group discussion with with the four of us plus the folks from last night and these are in no particular order but let's start with this first question i've got here what are some of the concerns when teaching combat and self-defense to women how might it be done better don't just all jump in at once i know this is this is the hard part when we're not when we're not face to face i understand that so I, i'm i'm gonna pick up pick on Ms. Henderson, why don't you go first? Okay. Um, Self-defense in schools with women. So um, I think that one of the things that comes into play, especially for, um, like, I I only have male instructors um, myself. I I am a female, obviously a female instructor, but (laughs) I only have male instructors that teach me. And I think one of the problems with the male instructors in, in teaching female self-defense is that it's hard for a male instructor to put their mind into the idea of being the smaller target. And they tend to teach martial arts self-defense that um, is not going to be very appropriate for a smaller, smaller target, a female to, to use against a larger target. So um, for, for example, um, to, just, I think listeners will know who Master Forsberg is. He's a big guy. He's about six foot, uh, 200 plus pounds. I'm not going to use a wrist lock on him. It's just not going to work. Um, and and I think it's harder for male instructors to to kind of get out of that that teaching that that they aren't the smaller target and they tend to teach things that aren't very appropriate mm. all the time. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. And, um, you know, I have to give a lot of credit to the male instructors that do say um, or that will differentiate, I suppose I should, I should say it that way, uh, between 
um, what might be effective for a person that is bigger than you or a person that's smaller than you um, when you're in that kind of self-defense uh, situation. So um, I do think that that's a great place to start when we kind of get to the how can it be done better side um, is, uh, you know, if you're running a drill that really is made for bigger people, just just let them know. Um, because, you know, uh, us black belts can look at something and say, okay, we're not going to do that because that's not going to work. But the last thing you want to do is give a drill to, um, you know, like a newbie white belt that, and, you know, nothing against white belts, certainly, but um, that won't quite know how to look at something and say, okay, this can work if it's somebody my size or smaller, but I shouldn't do this against, you know, somebody uh, like you were just talking about six foot, 200 plus. Um, so I think one of the things we can just do as instructors, both male and female instructors, is just to be very clear about what type of things will work against what type of people. And I've had students talk to me before and say, well, I don't know if this is something that I would necessarily use. And I say, that's right. fine. And that's what's important is being able to make sure that your students are developing that IQ so that they know what will work for them um, and what won't. But still emphasizing the importance of learning the drill anyway, um, because there is something to be taught there. And then also if they end up becoming instructors themselves and they know that they can teach that to um, a different crowd than what than what you know it was originally taught in. Um, but I think just being really clear and upfront is half the battle. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, sure, you can practice, you know, chokes and throws and all that kind of stuff. But in reality, is that really something that your five foot two, 110 pound student should be using? That's, that's pretty debatable. Right? Um, yeah. So I, I think really just, you know, not to, not to beat a dead horse here, but just be upfront about it. And so you can help your students develop that IQ of what's going to work for them and what they should probably not use because it might actually put them into a little bit of danger and just be upfront about it. You know, you know, everything you teach doesn't have to work for everybody. And I think that certain instructors sometimes get caught up on that. Um, and, uh, if, if we can all just kind of have this mindset of, um, of teaching our students what might work for them. Um, I think everybody will be a little better off. Yeah. Yeah. Mrs. Pettengill. Um, I- I would agree with everything that they have said so far. Um, I would also add into it that um, men and women tend to think about self-defense differently in terms of just um, being in your face. Uh, For for men, that's um, kind of a natural thing to do. And for women, to be taught, you know, to go in on somebody to do a technique, it's it's very difficult for them to learn that. Um, and so I think kind of doing, um, keeping that in mind as well, is that there's a mindset difference that has to be taken into consideration, not just a physical difference. Mm. Now... The idea of mindset came up, I, I think Ms. Henderson was the first one to to say that, and that kind of got some of my wheels turning. You know, how important when you're teaching self-defense, I, especially to women, I guess specifically to women, you're on here to talk about women, represent women, is that mindset. Can a man really put ever put himself in the place of a woman when teaching self-defense? I think they can, they can empathize. Um, cause I've had some really excellent male instructors say, you know, women, you know, ladies, elbows, knees, um, palm heels, those are going to be your best friends, not the, um, fancy wrist lock sort of escort self-defense police escort self-defense that sometimes is nifty to, to teach and to practice, but that's not going to really be effective for females versus somebody bigger. Um, so I've had some male instructors, you know, break it down and make it more practical and useful for female martial artists in that, in that way. So they can empathize. I don't know as if they can truly, does a man truly want to get into the mind of a woman? Really? (laughs) I I'm taking the fifth on that one. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I totally agree. And I think too, um, you know, it's never, they're never going to fully be in our minds. We're never going to be fully in there. So that's fine. And there's nothing wrong with that, but, I think empathy is really 
just where it starts. And that can go for female instructors to men too. Um, but uh, I think too, sometimes, especially when you have new students who you really don't know anything about, um, it's, it's worth being empathetic to the fact that this may be the first time that you know, this woman has ever taken a hit before or ever been in a close contact like that before, um, you know, and hopefully it is for them. But in the same time, uh, it may also not be. So while men are kind of used to this, you know, a little bit more aggressive nature and a little bit more roughhousing, I suppose, stereotypically, um, you know, being in a violent situation may actually, for certain women um, in your class, may actually bring up and I pray not, but some, some past trauma, um, that I think sometimes you just need to be empathetic towards and just make sure that you emphasize it. Um, you know, it's a controlled environment and, and you're not going to get hurt and that kind of thing. Um, or, you know, for any kids that maybe got bullied on the playground or something like that, just being empathetic to the fact that some people are going to receive, um, an aggressive attack in class or, you know, being thrown or punched or something like that a lot different, <clears throat> a lot differently and maybe sometimes with a more emotional response um, than men might. And, you know, maybe they will, maybe they won't. It's, you know, kind of up in the air, especially like I said, when you have new students, you don't know, but it's just being empathetic to the fact that, you know, maybe this is a little bit touchy of a situation for them. And, you know, you can still teach your lessons and that's fine, but, you know, just, just kind of keep in the back of your head. And not really force your students to ever have to do anything they're not comfortable doing, I think is, building on that is like key, you know, you can empathize. And, and then if, you know, you got even anybody who's really sensitive to it, you know, you know what, I really, I think I feel really uncomfortable doing this. The idea of having to purposely hurt somebody just that really bothers me. Can I sit this one out? And I, I feel like instructors being open to that is also builds a more positive relationship. Now that seems like that would be a really fine line yes. between pushing a student and pushing a student too far. You know, I mean, there's, there's, there's discomfort and then there's something that's coming from really a place of, of trauma, I guess, I guess maybe is a, a good way to put it. Right. right. Obviously, if you really know the student, if it's a student that you've known for years and you've had personal conversations with them, it's pretty easy to draw that line. But how might you draw that line in someone that has been training for a month? I think yeah. a lot of it comes down to um, introducing certain self-defense drills, especially ones that might feel a little bit more aggressive in nature, um, introducing them very carefully in the sense that you explain what will happen, but also, you know, what's the worst case scenario here. Um, and, uh, I actually, I actually think that, um, we see it a lot when we have, um, new white belt males come in specifically teens because we'll have them, you know, put on sparring gear for the first time and okay, maybe they match them up with me. Um, you know, a 22 year old black belt. And all of a sudden the teens or teen boys are like, I can't, I can't hit her, which on one hand, you certainly have to appreciate <laughs> the way that they were raised. I mean, thank you for that. But, um, you know, you kind of have to ease them into it a little by little and say, okay, you know, this is in a controlled environment. You're going to be just fine. And, you know, maybe their first time sparring in class, all they do is block and that's fine. And then maybe they can throw a light counter. You know, and then I think step by step, you can't expect Rowan to be building a day with certain students um, or with any students. And so just really ease them into it and let them know that it's a controlled environment. And um, it, it, the more upfront you can be about the drills in the in the classes in your curriculum, the better, because then people aren't really taken um, by surprise and they're not going to have anything that shocks them. I don't think, you know, shock value is what you're going for with your white belts. So I think the more upfront you can be. Um, mm -hmm the better. Definitely. Okay. This is Pat and go. How do you draw that line in your school? Well, that's that it goes to, to what Katie's actually saying there in, in terms of you have to start teaching these things with the basics. You don't jump. You don't, I don't put sparring gear on a white belt. It doesn't happen until they have been there for enough time that they show me some self control. Um, I've had my ribs cracked by a white belt and I don't appreciate it and nobody does. So it, you have to build on that. Um, and so we have a step process in terms of you learn the basics, you do no contact sparring, you do three steps, you do two steps, you do one steps, um, you know, and eventually then you get to some light 
contact kind of thing. But I want to kind of back up a little bit to what what was being talked about earlier in terms of um, the reaction that women have um, to sparring and combat situations and self-defense. And, and I think it's important for men to understand that women's reactions to those types of situations is not the same as what a man has. Um, you know, a guy's going to tend to kind of react by being a little bit more forceful. A woman may break down in tears. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that it, they're not, um, that they're uncomfortable. I'm trying to think of the right word I want to say. It doesn't mean that they're having a, a hard time with it. It's just how they react. That's just how some people react to stress, is to cry. Um, and men get really freaked out about that. And they're like, oh, my God, did I hurt you? Um, but it just needs to have some some psychological kind of, all right, are you there? Are you with me? Are you ready to move on kind of approach rather than saying, oh, well, you're not comfortable with this and let's back off. Mm. And speaking as, as, you know, the man here on the conversation, absolutely. Working with a woman that, or, or anyone really that, that starts to get emotional, whether it's tears or, you know, recognizing panic or anger, you know, any kind of extreme emotion really will set me back and make me question everything that I've done with that person leading up to it. What have I done to initiate that response? And it's something that, you know, knocking on 40 here, I'm just starting to learn that it's not always a direct result of what I've done. It could be, you know, 3% from what I've done that, you know, sparked a memory that just came mm -hmm. flooding back, you know, so that, that can be really challenging, I think, as a, as a guy to learn, but a valuable lesson. Definitely. Okay. Let's talk about how men and women are, are different, really, not just in actuality, because I, I think, you know, we, we, most of the people listening have been through health class. <laughs> and, and we understand the, the physiological differences there. But when it comes to martial arts and when it comes to being a man in martial arts or a woman in martial arts, you know, we've got some perceived differences, but then there are some, some actual differences. What are those? Where do you draw that line? What, is, what are the real differences? What are the perceived differences that might not be so true? Well, I'd like to start this one off. <laughs> Please, by all means. <laughs> um, you know, I think the perceived difference is that women are, are weaker um, and that we tend to be very docile. Um, and I actually find that to be not necessarily true. Um, we just express ourselves differently than men do. Um, we react differently than guys do to physical contact. Um, and we've been kind of wired that way. It's just, you know, when, when you're near a man, you instantly become very hypervigilant, whether you've had a, a bad experience or not. It's just, you've been taught that. So you have to kind of, um, it's not true that we're weaker. We are, we are very much strong, a strong both emotionally and physically, um, we can be very, very strong. Okay. Ms. Henderson? Um, going into that sort of the differences between uh, male and female martial artists and weak versus strong, and I was having actually a lengthy conversation with the male martial artist that lives with me this morning about this, um, that... It's not, we've, we've kind of found that the women can do, or, or, or they do everything that the men do in martial arts, the female martial arts and the, and the male martial arts, but we find that the men tend to try more new and dangerous things and 
I was asking him about this, and he said, well, women have more common sense, first of all. We're not, <laughs> the, the women are not going to climb two steps up a wall and try to break a board with their head, um, which we did have a male teenager attempt to do last week. Um, but it has to do with a bit more of, I don't know if you guys see this in your school, but like peacocking, like the male students try to one up each other and the female students are like, nah, we're good. We don't need to. <laughs> I'll set. And it's the male students are like, yeah, you can break, you can break three boards. Well, I can break four boards. And they just do this, this, I mean, it's not quite that aggressive really, but it is a little bit of this peacocking, um, business that's going on and we find that the women just don't do that they just don't feel the need to validate themselves by looking better than everybody else i would i would agree with you on that one <laughs> uh, and and it's interesting because i will watch you know like when we do side by side drills kicking on bags and so on when two guys come up against each other even if they're not on the same bag They'll look at each other and be like, oh, well, I knocked it over and you didn't. Yeah. Oh, right. <laughs> a little peacocking. A little, I had another word for it, but it's not appropriate for the show. <laughs> I think we're all in the uh, same, same brainwave with that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I agree. And I, I am very lucky with the, the students that I have that everybody is uh, pr pretty much keeps themselves in check, but. I, uh, I'm, I'll be the, the first to announce in class that I, and thankfully I don't have to often, but I have a very much no ego policy. Um, I don't want to, I don't want to hear it from them because I know that they don't really probably want to hear it from me. And, um, you know, it's just, it's a distraction. I think when, when people start to peacock and it's kind of like, what's the point, you know, everybody develops differently. It's not a big deal. Um, and I don't know if maybe that is a male, female thing. Um, uh, at the dojo with um, with Shihan Andy, it's actually mostly males, so maybe we just don't. I don't see that dynamic enough. But um, yeah, I mean the egos can play in a little bit sometimes. Um, I think as far as out of the dojo perception, um, I think sometimes uh, people think of martial arts for women, um, especially when you're a little bit older, as more of like this quote unquote activity like how moms will take yoga or Pilates or spin class or something like that. It's oh, like, oh, yeah. you're taking martial arts. Okay. You know, yeah. are you getting into shape? Have you lost a pant size? That's great. And then there are some people that just want to do it as an activity and, and that's fine. Um, and that's, you know, there are people out there that want to do that and that no big deal, but there are other people that this is a lifestyle for them that they just happen to start, you know, after their kids are in middle school or something like that. And I don't think that you quite get that with men as much. Um, and I'm talking more outside of the dojo. I, I maybe it's just how lucky I've been, but I, there is a lot of respect for women inside the dojos I've been involved with. Um, but uh, I I think that there's just a little bit more of this perception that we're not totally legitimate until we prove ourselves, and whether that be by getting a big win at a tournament or maybe put like a a kick-ass video on social media, or you achieve a high rank or something like that. Um, whereas maybe that's not quite the same thing with men and um you know we can we can kind of cry out and say that it's not fair and it's not a and you know in a perfect world we wouldn't have to do that um and of course we wouldn't but frankly life isn't always fair and I think if you ask any woman in in the military in the corporate world they're going to kind of say that the same thing that they feel they need to prove themselves a little bit more um and does it stink sometimes of course it does but um I actually find it to be really motivating and uh you know it's it's just one of those things where it just means you're in the dojo and, and working hard and um, putting in that extra time and studying. And um, Jeremy, I know you and I talked about this in my interview, you get out of it what you put in. Mm. And I, I know it sounds painfully cliche, like a cliche, but uh, I think there's really nothing more motivating than, than proving people wrong. Um, and uh, you know, showing up to that high school reunion in shape and kicking butt and uh, you know, showing people what you're worth and proving people wrong it's actually really satisfying so um you know is it perfect that it's that way of course it's not and I wish that it wasn't like I said but um you know I, I if if it bothers you use it as motivation and I found that that's that's very much uh something that I like to do in in my own martial arts career it's great advice 
Um, and, and I also would add that I think a lot of times the perception of um, female martial arts comes from the media um, mm. be because we don't, on a regular basis, most people don't see female martial artists in their daily lives. Or if they do, they don't know that they are martial artists. So unfortunately, the media has colored um, a bit what is expected of us uh, as female martial artists. Um, you know, you have to be able to do, you know, do a split and kick over your head and, um, you know, be all pretty with your techniques. Um, and, uh, and that's not what it's about for me. It's, and I don't think it is for the, stu the female students in my school. You know, we are, we're there to, learn and to be stronger and to be able to defend ourselves or to accomplish you know whatever our goals are so mm. damn that media <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's one thing that I tend to like be fighting with my male counterparts in the studio is is not really fighting but sort of encouraging them to change their language in the studio like don't say that the little the little girls are pretty in their martial arts like tell them that they're strong tell them that they're you know, there that technique looked real, like that technique was sharp. You know, kind of stay away from that pretty to try and get out of that stereotype a little bit. Now, on this show, we don't talk a lot about mixed martial arts. You know, this is a, a traditional martial arts podcast. But I think when if you were to ask anyone in, in the U.S. at least, who do you think of when you think of female martial artists? And, and I don't mind bringing her up because she does have a legitimate traditional background and she's actually fighting tonight and that's Ronda Rousey. Mm -hmm. Do you <laughs> think Ronda Rousey's success uh, as a fighter, as an Olympian and in culture has been beneficial to the perception of women as martial artists or has it taken it the other way and maybe harmed the perception? I personally think, um, you know, is she totally perfect? Nobody is. But I think all in all, when you look at it in the grand scheme of things, I think she has um, done good things. Um, you know, she's extremely accomplished. Um, before she got into the UFC, uh, when she was um, competing in the Olympics for judo, and then now as a mixed martial artist as well. And she's obviously extremely talented. So now you have all these guys um, who are not in martial arts watching her fight and watching Holly Holm fight. And uh, all of a sudden she has male fans and they're kind of saying, wait a minute, sh she is a badass. She can fight. She can grapple with the best of them. Um, and they know she could kick their butts. And, uh, you know, it, you got to kind of give her credit for that, definitely. And I think as far as just her personally, um, I have at least... I, maybe this is just within my own circles. I certainly want to speak for everybody, but she, you know, when she did her weigh-ins yesterday, I don't know if you guys caught that, but she um, is in extremely good shape. I mean, the woman she is, is shredded. She is shredded. Um, oh and uh, I see more and more um, teens and young women seeing that type of body, somebody that obviously works out a lot, exercises, eats really healthy, as being a lot, quote unquote, prettier or more attractive than where we kind of were like 10 years ago, where we have these like 90 pound actresses who are just starving themselves um, as being this pinnacle of beauty, if you want to put it that way. And then to look at somebody like Ronda Rousey, who now is beyond just a famous athlete. I mean, she's a celebrity and seeing an absolutely cut body like that and saying, you know, that that's much more of what we want to be somebody that has that's that has muscle um, and abs and, you know, great back and all that kind of stuff. And it's like, I, I certainly have to be appreciative that she's brought in this idea that it's okay to be a strong cut muscular woman and you don't have to be all skin and bones and showing your ribs um, to be thought of as, you know, attractive or whatever the case may be. And uh, I think that's great, you know, mm -hmm. definitely. And and I would I would agree with you on all of that. I think that's awesome. Um, but I think that sometimes I hear some of the male um, people around me who 
don't necessarily know that I'm a martial artist, but they they see, you know, Ronda Rousey and the other MMA women, and immediately, you know, they jump to some very um, derogatory kinds of thinking about them um, in terms of, oh, she takes steroids, or she must be a homosexual, or she must blah, blah, blah. And it's like, come on, can't you just take her for what she is at, as an, a professional athlete who is extremely accomplished and has made some major inroads with, you know, young women and men. And that's a criticism, I think, that comes up of all professional athletes. If you look at, you know, the way that professional boxing, professional, well, maybe not professional wrestling in, in what people are going to think of when I say professional wrestling, but, you know, Olympic, you know, Greco-Roman wrestling or really any other sports, there certainly is a group. There are a lot of people that, maybe I shouldn't say a lot, there are those that are going to be using performance enhancing drugs, but I think the perception of use is much greater than the actuality. And I almost wonder if, if looking at her and, and saying, Hey, she's, you know, she's got to be taking something. Is that leveling the playing field? Is, is there something inherently non-sexist in that question? Wait, I'm sorry. What, what do you mean? Say that again. <laughs> Um, so the, the, the root of this original question was talking about the differences between men and women, right? Yeah. So is it, is, is to point at Ronda Rousey and say, for someone to point at her and say, she's got to be on steroids. Is that lumping her in with other professional athletes, male and female that already are criticized in that way? You know, the skepticism, there's no way that that's natural, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, I think that there might be some of that, but I think it's just difficult for for some men to see women, um, very strong women, and not think something derogatory about that. Sure, sure. And and a lot of listeners to the show, uh, people that have been listening for a long time, anybody that knows me personally, knows that, you know, in addition to martial arts, I'm pretty active in the CrossFit community and In CrossFit, you know, we have a lot of women that are big and strong and and shredded and and have a a similar body type to Ronda Rousey. So maybe I'm operating from a different perspective than than a typical male might be. But I look at that and I, you know, uh, Sensei Jordan, just as you were saying that, you know, that ideal that society is looking at is starting to shift. And, I, I, you know, I, I fully agree. And I think it's great. And I think we can we can look at Ronda Rousey as someone who i mean let let's be honest she is the biggest star in mixed martial arts and yes i don't know that there is another sport out there that has a men's and women's division where the woman is the most popular the only one honestly that comes to mind is serena williams um <laughs> but yeah. if you think about all of i mean she's a tank but if you think about all of the sports out there, I mean, that, I, that's pretty much it. You know, I, I would give women higher popularity in gymnastics, and that's about it. That's the only one, honestly, that comes to mind. Yeah. Um, so, and yeah, I, I totally agree. I think I totally some agree. of the gymnastics is is around what we're exposed to, right? I mean, the only reason we sure, sure. most Americans know anything about gymnastics is because the TV tells us to care every four years about it. <laughs> and most of what they show us is women's gymnastics. Circling On the flip side, the when we think about, sorry, I said just said circling back to the media again. But yes, right. No, but oh, and, and, and you know, we don't have any questions on the media specifically, which is interesting. As we're starting to talk about this, that that didn't come up for any of us as we were putting together an outline. But when you look at the fight card in any mixed martial arts event, whether it's the UFC or Bellator or something else, it's heavily skewed towards male fighters, right? If you look, if you go to an amateur fight and, and we have some here in Vermont, there might be one female fight on the card. And so despite that skewed percentage, 
Ronda Rousey has, has popped up. And, you know, I, I just, I wish that we as traditional martial artists had something a little more publicized so we could, we could push in that direction too. But that's a whole, well, o- whole other conversation. In the Olympic world, if we start thinking about that too, that, that Kayla, I forget her last name, Kayla uh, Harrison. Yeah, she was in the judo, mm-hmm. yes. and she like kicks some so, like so much butt in the judo division, and she's been coming up through as far as focusing on female athletes. And um, the swimmer there, oh my god, Ledecky. Yep. Uh, oh yeah, Katie, Katie, Ledecky. Katie Ledecky. Katie Ledecky. Yeah, and she's won some world records in swimming too. Uh, you know, typically sports that you you know Michael Phelps was dominating. Everybody knows Michael Phelps dominating in swimming and. Uh, I mean, I feel like any casual civilian would think not really that judo is part of the Olympics. So it's she's kind of na- making a name for uh, for that. Mm-hmm. Kay- that Kayla is. So we have some female martial art, female athletes that are coming up through that are really getting a lot of spotlight, which is really great to see. Well, and and, and just to kind of think about that in in a little bit longer a remoter kind of history. I mean, Gina um, was fighting, I can't remember her last name. Corrado? Uh, Corrado? Yes. I mean, she was fighting in mix, mixed martial arts 10 years ago. Um, and she made a little bit of inroad, but certainly, you know, over the last five years, we've seen a big resurgence and a big insurgence of, of female, um, who, female fighters who have the win record and the personality and the wherewithal to make them take the spotlight. Um, you know, like, like Sensei Jordan was saying, Rhonda Rousey is a star across multiple areas. It's not just in the ring. And she was able to break that. And I think that's when her stardom kind of just, took over Hmm. yeah i think there are some people that are just destined to become a star and it doesn't matter what they do they're going to break out of that and reach some kind of prominence and i I think that she is one of them and we we've talked a a lot about the media we've talked about some of the the differences in in actuality but i'd like to focus a little bit on some of the differences that the the wider world or the male participants of martial arts might have of women that aren't true. You know, if if you, if yeah, yeah. We, you know, the question that we put together was what are the differences in reality and in perception? Are there differences in perception that aren't actually there? And if the answer is no, that's not a, that's not a bad thing. I mean that 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 tells me that you know maybe the the gap between the way martial arts is treating women and the way we should be is not as wide as some people might might think as I may have thought coming into this conversation. Sometimes I feel like that the the male martial artists sort of assume that the females are more flexible. I know that that's sort of really like a small thing. Um but it's not always the case. Just okay. throw, throwing it out there. I, there are days where I'm not that flexible and I got men lining up next to me that are sky high kicking. Um, so that's like one thing is that there's that perception that females are supposed to be flexible, supposed to kick really high, you know, a la Chloe, Blue, Chloe Bruce. <laughs> like oh that's a that's what a female martial artist is supposed to look like like no 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 okay so the last question the last structured question you know we, we made tangent some more and i'm quite good with that as you all know that we have down here is the differences between men and women sparring you know we i'm we, we've talked a little bit about men and work, women working together and, and the way men might posture lining up next to each other. But what are the issues that come up when we're talking about a man and a woman sparring together 
within their school. I'm actually a fan of having them go together um, right from the get go, unless there's a, you know, a, a woman will vocalize that she's not comfortable with that just yet. Then sure you can make exceptions. But um, I actually think personally putting a, a new woman fighter in with a very experienced uh, black belt male fighter is actually one of the best ways to go. Mm-hmm. Um, if that's something that you can, you know, pull logistically based on who you have for students. Um, a guy that's, you know, six foot, 200, whatever, you know, we were saying early, <clears throat> earlier is going to have a lot more knowledge of his power and a lot more control as opposed to just, you know, throwing them in um, with an intermediate belt who, uh, as somebody mentioned earlier, might crack a rip. Um, and then I think also once that woman finishes around and, you know, spars a couple of minutes with this giant guy and realizes that she doesn't get hurt, I think immediately you can't help but have a newfound confidence. Um, and uh, if you can start that from the beginning and build it from there, I think that that's great. Um, that being said, um, there are, and I think you, you know as an instructor, certain students who don't have as good of control as they need to. And, um, you know, that's something that really needs to be hammered down on them a little bit. Um, you know, we have our teenage boys that, that hit really hard. And so we kind of toss them together and ha ha, it's fun. They beat the crap out of each other and they love it. But, um, and why they, they do, they really love it. But, no, uh, I got them in my <laughs> same thing. yeah, but, um, you know, you can't all of a sudden throw them in with this 14 year old girl who comes to class and, you know, let things fly business as usual. Um, so I do think letting your older male black belts kind of set an example for everybody else is actually just going to trickle down, um, and set a good example for, for the rest of the students. And, um, just, you know, explain it. I, I, I hate to circle back to what I was sort of saying earlier, cause I feel like I'm being a little repetitious, but, um, just being upfront with them and, and saying, you know, I know that it's might feel weird to put on gloves and spar a giant male and, it might be a little scary, but, um, you know, you're not going to be seeing any techniques you haven't seen before and you know how to block and, um, you know, we're going to practice and work on this. And the more upfront you are with them, the more comfortable you're going to be when you, when they, when, when women put the gear on. Um, and if you can put them with those black belts that are going to, you know, push them a little bit, but still keep it in a controlled environment, um, you're going to be much better off. You know, the, the thing you hate to see the most is like a first or second time student sparring and they're with an uncontrolled person um, or a person who just loses control for a second and they get rocked Mm -hmm. and then they never want to put the gear on again. Mm -hmm. That's the last thing you want to see, but we've all seen it. Uh, I was that person. Yes. Well, there you go. Right. Literally I was that person. So I understand. Yep. Definitely. So if one of the, the important elements there is making sure that the older black belts, you know, especially the men, I shouldn't say older black belts, the the senior students, you know, black belts, Mm -hmm. especially the men, have a good understanding of how to treat a newer white belt woman. What should they know? You know, if there's someone out there that is just about to open a school or, you know, just about to be entrusted with this responsibility of making sure people understand these things, what would you want them to know? Like what we want the experienced fighter yeah, yeah. How, how, how should they conduct themselves and what should they be watching for? Um, well, obviously, they should um, understand that women may be a little bit reluctant to be aggressive or to throw punches or kicks or whatever. Um, so to allow them to actually make some contact um, and yes. let the person be successful. That's important. Um, and I, I think also um, they, they should know that anyways, if they've made it to the rank of black belt, but um, <laughs> they should also have really good self-control when they are returning um, their techniques, you know, you can hit the person, but, pull the techniques and make sure that, you know, your punch is only a, a quarter strength and not full on. Um, 
you know, those kinds of things are very important. Going into that as their well as job. Just... Well, I was just going to say in their job as a, as a higher rank, at least in my opinion, is to teach. And if right. they are just there to show what they can do, then they're not a good teacher. Mm -hmm. Right. And I was going to add in there too with with the con with the pulling the technique, the contact, you know, just to as an experienced fighter, the the, the male experienced fighter, just just to remember that contact is relative. Um, what they might think is light contact, that beginner could could feel that as like medium to heavy contact. So just just yeah. being aware that um, you know, that, that that contact is relative. That white belt might get a little bit of gumption behind them and, and kick that fighter, you know you know, with a good, you know, solid thump, but that doesn't give that experienced fighter license to go and thump them back. Because again, contact is relative. You, what I would think as, um, you know, I'm five, six, 150, like what I would think is a, a heavy, like medium to heavy contact coming at me could just be light contact from a, from a bigger experienced fighter, you know, like just, just remembering that, you know, and, oh, I didn't hit her that hard, or I didn't really, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't think I hit her that hard. Yes, but if you, you, you might not be aware of that contact and how strong that contact could feel to a white belt. And it's an excellent opportunity to work on your control. Yes. Too, <laughs> right. You know, as you were talking about that, I, I'm imagining, you know, somebody coming in that maybe grew up as a as an only child that didn't, you know, rough house with siblings and maybe has never been hit in that way. So even 10% power could be shocking to them. Exactly. You know, what you think, what that experienced fighter thinks is they're only giving 5% of what they can do, that inexperienced fighter could think that that's full contact if they have no, you know, it's relative. Pain is relative. Contact is relative. And just keeping that in mind when, if, and when that white belt starts to cry, if you think you've hit them too hard or, or something to that effect, you know, circling back a little on the, it might not be you, it could be you, but it might not be. And just keeping that in yeah. mind. I would say also, one of the other differences between um, men and women sparring is, uh, um, you know, one of the biggest areas for points is the torso. And, you know, women have breasts in that area. Mm -hmm. um, and it hurts. Whether yep. they're big or small or otherwise, and it does hurt to get hit there. <laughs> um, and we don't really have very good um, protection equipment. For that, um, you know, guys go ahead and put their cup on, and you know, I don't see too many women wearing um, chest protectors. But it is an area, and it's a target area, and it's a it's a point area. So sometimes they get hit there, and again, men need to understand that it does hurt. Also, getting kicked in the uterus hurts a lot. Yes, it does. <laughs> it does hurt so much. I was wearing a chest guard, and a friend of mine kicked me. She kicked me so hard. The bottom of that chest guard went right into my lower abdomen and I just about threw up. Like it was so painful. So, you know, that it hurts. It hurts to get kicked in general. It does. You know, that that's a it's not something that that I as a man has ev have ever been told. You know, I mean, I, I understand and only, you know, it's probably in the last 10 years have I ever had I understood that, hey, you know what, being kicked in the breast hurts, you know, and, and I mean, growing up as a kid, you know, we're taught, okay, you know, you put on gloves. So when you if you accidentally hit somebody in the face, it doesn't hurt and you put on boots for the same reason. And men put on a cup, because, you know, that hurts. And everywhere yes. else that you hit is fine. You know, don't hit people in the back because because, you know, you can hit them in the spine and that can be bad. Right. But pretty much anywhere that's not joints you're good to go. And it took a long time for me to understand that, hey, no, that's that that does hurt there. No, the anatomy there, I mean, certainly I understand is different than my own in my chest, but that there was pain that would come from being hit there. 
And I'm guessing I'm not the only one that ha hasn't understood that over the years. Yeah, and I, I think it's too, you know, one of those things where you don't want to walk into a sparring class and say, hey, guys, don't hit me here, don't hit me there, because that really hurts, and blah, 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 blah. You don't want to walk, be the one to walk into a fighting class and announce all these places. You don't want to be hit because um, that's not really a great look. But, you know, if we could just put a PSA out there just so it's not anything that should be shocking anymore, then, you know, let's just cover our bases. Um, yeah, it sucks to be hit in the chest. Just as we'll try to avoid hitting you in the groin, try to at least not, you know, sucker punch us there. And uh, we'll all have a much more pleasant karate class. Now, Miss Henderson, you brought up, um, you know, being kicked in a way that that traveled through and caused pain internally. Is yes. there something that people should watch out for, or or is that just an unfortunate thing that's going to happen once in a while? Um, a little bit of a, a little bit of B. I think that I'm not really sure. I think most women wear their belt, their taekwondo, karate, martial arts belt, around their hips. So just in the same way that you don't kick a man below the belt, try not to kick a woman below the belt because that's where all the that's where all the organs are in that lower abdomen, and the knot of that belt going straight in just mm. is not pleasant. So not just kicking below the belt, but kicking on the belt. Um, yeah. Okay. I think I'm trying to think that through, like logistically. And that's not licensed to pull your belt up to your armpits. No, <laughs> I, I, I think we've all seen small children that, that yeah. figure that one out and they're like, oh, I can't get hit below the belt. And they start to pull it up and they think they're putting one over on us. I'll wear it as a necklace. Yeah. Right. <laughs> okay. Are there any other thoughts that you've had as we've been talking today, as we start to wind down here? Anything else that you want to bring up? Anything that you want men to know, women to, to know that they're not alone in? Um, has it been said in your show yet, Jeremy, that, you know, black pants are like for, and especially in, uh, Taekwondo, black pants are reserved for the, for the black belts. And I've had a lot of, um, moms come up to me and say, when can I wear the black pants? Um, so, know that you're not alone in suffering with the white pants. <laughs> yeah. So I, I want to, I want to take the opportunity to, to shout out somebody specific who may or may not be listening to this show because it was that person and this subject that started my mind moving in a different way on this subject and ultimately led to these conversations. And it's someone that, you know, of course, master Laura Napoli has been a good friend to me and to the show over the years that I've known her. And we exchanged some emails. I think this goes back um, over six months. And she brought the idea to me that there are women that will avoid training about 25% of the time, because it means that they're, required to wear white pants and they are apprehensive about that and as a traditionalist as someone who grew up in a, in a school where until you reached the rank of brown belt it was white pants all the time mm -hmm. i never even consider that i'm a guy i don't have a menstrual cycle so why don't you speak on that a little bit more but i just i wanted to take that opportunity to thank master napoli for uh for kind of cramming that one into my head and getting me thinking a little differently um, you want me to speak more about the black pants? Yeah. Yeah. And just kind of how, how you feel about that. And maybe if, if, you know, Mrs. Pettengill and, and Sensei Jordan, if you have thoughts on, on the subject as well. Oh, um, definitely. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Do you guys wear black pants in your schools? I don't, I have no idea. We do um, not. We wear, we wear white all the time. Okay. Yeah. I actually allow my students to, um, use whatever color, uniform they'd like. I have blue, red, pink, um, whatever they want. The only, my only criteria is testing day has to be white. Okay. I, I should clarify at our, at my home dojo, um, we are the, the same way as Ms. Pettengill said, we can wear, um, any, any color, but, um, where I teach down in Massachusetts, we are, um, part of an affiliated club. So they kind of set the rules for us. Um, and it is traditional karate, so we do all wear white. Um, but uh, as far as that goes, I mean, are are the rules in traditional Shotokan really going to get changed? Not not really. I I know it's not the answer some people want, but it's 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 the truth. Um, and uh, so the only 
the only tidbit I can give for that is I think just a piece of advice. And that's all I kind of have. And my only piece of advice is um, invest in some spandex, like the kind that you would wear under um, soccer shorts. Some people call them like bike shorts. Mm. Yep. Put them under your gi pants. That's all you need. That's it. That's, that's my only piece I'm going to offer. I stocked up on those on Black Friday and they will, uh, they're wonderful. So that's my, that's my 10 cents. Uh, just that I, um, on my end, I guess that, you know, lots, like I said, lots of moms, when can we wear the black pants? When can we wear the black pants? And I sympathize with that, but at the same time, like I suffered through the white pants. So, and it didn't, too. <laughs> like, it, it didn't affect my training. I was just like, eh, like it's a concern of mine, but at the same time, like, uh, part, part of me is like, you, you want it, you're going to wear the white pants because you, if you want to eventually wear the black pants, you've got to work for it. And yeah, wear, agreed. wear the white in order to earn the black as they, you know, that's how it is always. Um, but I, I, I agree and that get some spandex if you're concerned. Um, it's uh, to me, it seems to be a, a conflict between tradition and, and where we come from and also making what we do as approachable as possible. You know, it, obviously in, in my role here at Whistlekick, I spend a lot of time dealing with marketing. And one of the pieces of mar marketing advice I picked up many years ago was make it as easy as possible for people to do business with you. And this mm -hmm. is kind of, kind of a similar thing. Make it as easy as possible for someone to come train with you. And, you know, that that's a very real conflict. And I've had this conversation with other people, you know, you know, other, other than, than you folks, other than Master Napoli. So it's, you know, I don't know that there's a right answer, but I think as long as people have the option of different schools that do things differently, they can find one that works if, if that's something that's important to them. Right. And I think I would just hope that, uh, the men listening might be a little more sensitive to to that specific subject because again you know just as i and, and i'm assuming the vast majority of the men listening have never had breasts um we've never had a menstrual cycle so it's hard to empathize with that one other thing on uniforms in general um the the uniforms, I and I don't know about the karate uniforms, but um, taekwondo uniforms um, are not fitted for women. Um, you know, if you get get a size that that fits you around, uh, it, you know, it may be a dress, or <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, the sides are cut up so high that you know your your sports bra is exposed. Um, you know, those are there are some companies that do make female cut uniforms, um, but they're ungodly expensive mm. and they're, they're made out of a hundred percent cotton. So after you wash them a couple of times, they look like you just pulled them out of, you know, the laundry basket without folding them. Um, and you know, if you're trying to portray a, a, a a professional look and your uniform is wrinkled, you know, what do you, that that's an area that I think needs some attention as well. Jeremy, get on this market. Uh, yep. Um, you, 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 I, I there's, there's nothing to announce yet, but you would be surprised perhaps at the number of hours I've already invested in this. That's Sweet. awesome. Yeah. It's, Sweet. It, it, so, it is. We will likely have uh, women's uniforms before overall uniforms is my guess because awesome. because this is the feedback that, that we've received and this is probably the next big product after the sparring gear. No awesome. paper thin bottoms. I don't want to be able to, like, I know that another concern is like underwear being able to see through the pants. So yes, I suggest make them a little bit of a heavier, you know, not like, not like a five ounce uniform because that's super light, but not like a 14 ounce uniform either or a 10 ounce, maybe like an eight. Well, we, we were planning on doing everything cut really well, but completely transparent. You know, just made out of, <laughs> out of like a thin plastic. Um, so, so, so like a saran all, wrap. Yeah, yeah. So you had all of the disadvantages of a thin uniform, but without the benefits of breathability. 
Excellent. We're just that trying to make like it the worst thing thought. possible. No. <laughs> I will say, though, I like the Adidas Taekwondo traditional uniforms uh, with the, the V-neck. I mean, they're expensive. They're, they're $90 um, through dynamicsworld.com. But with, with $30 of shipping, it's outrageous, the price of them. But I will say, like, they're, they're cut pretty nice. They got that rubber band on the inside to keep the uniform down. Um, and they fit almost fairly accurately. So if you're looking for ladies, if you're looking for a woman's uniform, I will, other than whistle kick, when that one goes out, the <laughs> is a pretty good one. That's a great suggestion. All right, cool. Well, I think that we've had a great conversation today. I appreciate the time and we covered a lot of good stuff. You guys didn't make me work very hard, which I always appreciate. <laughs> I just kind of got to hang back and learn some stuff. I hope everybody out there listening learn some stuff and so i just i thank you for being here thank you thank you for having us thank you appreciate it i really have to say one of my favorite things about hosting this show is that i get the opportunity to talk about martial arts to talk about the things that are important to us as martial artists maybe not to all of us but to some of us to many of us and we keep hitting on some great stuff that honestly has made me a better martial artist just through conversation. When we talk about martial arts as personal development, this stuff that goes on here on this show, the conversations that happen here, the conversations that happen off air between you and your friends, you and your instructors, you and anybody as they relate to martial artists. As they relate to martial arts does make you a better martial artist. And through all of that, through those conversations, through this collective consciousness, through making each other think, the martial arts becomes better. And I thank you for that. I thank you for that opportunity. And I hope that you enjoy today's episode. We won't be back with a part three next week. We will be back with something new, but we're always looking for ways to kind of challenge our own formats. So if you have an idea, something that you want to do as a roundtable, maybe we can bring you on to participate if you have the idea for something completely out of the box, let us know. You should be able to tell by now I'm open to doing just about anything if it's something that sounds fun and if it's something that I think the community would enjoy. So by all means, get a hold of us. Info at whistlekick.com. If you want to get to me directly, Jeremy at whistlekick.com. You can find us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, YouTube, Instagram. We've got all the episodes up on YouTube. You can also find them over on the show notes, whistlekickmarshartsradio.com. And if you want to check out that great stuff we've got for sale, sparring gear and apparel and all that other stuff, whistlekick.com. That's all I've got to throw at you today. So thanks for listening. Take care. Have a great day. And we'll be back on Monday with another wonderful interview. Have a great weekend.